So the themes that emerged were listening as a facilitator. How do I gather information from participants and listen to what they're saying? To fostering empathy, how do I send ripples of empathy? Third one was facilitating self. Fourth was delivering content through the 21st century skills. Fifth was preparing for a group that I don't know, what do I do? Sixth was asking questions and how to get it right. Seventh was influence and manipulation, what's the difference and which one makes sense? So I'm just going to take it from the first one, which is, which is Neha's question. Uh, during a debrief, as I'm listening to the responses of different participants, how do I do the processing in that moment to bring it all together and move the group in their learning experience? Ah, okay. There is no easy way. But I think what's most relevant when you're working with a group is to stay with the group. We often get involved in what's going on in our heads. When we're dealing with that, and we're not listening to the group. So see if you can see if you can listen to what they are saying and not what you are thinking. And that's probably the most critical thing. Just remember that when we are with a group, it's a service that we are offering to the group by our very presence as facilitators. And therefore it makes sense that we find ourselves completely with them when we're listening to them. Um, some pointers that might be of use here are uh, just mo moving with purpose without irritation, frustration, or anxiety. And how do, you, how do we stay in that moment of grace when we are working with a group? Also, moving with curiosity. The moment we become curious about what's going on with the group and we are genuinely interested in what's going on there, chances are that we are more likely to pay attention to what they're saying than what's going on in our head. And which means staying open to discovery no matter what the circumstance. Yeah, just remember that uh, it's not as if I'm going to say it and you're going to understand it. That I know. <laughs> <laughs> but is there anything that you... Is there a question you have? No, and I think we've sort of had discussions about this before as well in terms of like, as a facilitator, sometimes you do have an agenda. So how do you sort of balance that and keep it lightly on your shoulder like you used to say? So I guess it's the right. struggle with uh, that. Yeah. And also, do they be sort of stay curious about the process? Right. Also remember that the less you carry around, uh, the more is likely to happen, but uh, you have to then risk it at some point in time. Sure. And maybe only a bald head can get you there. But try. <laughs> <laughs> For the bald okay. head? <laughs> yeah, well, or, I don't know. Sure. Uh, sometimes it's just the years. And the more you practice letting go, uh, you find that, you know, which is why I sent that uh, uh, what was going on with me was essentially that. You know, this is a time for collecting and there's a time to let go as well. And I think maybe Corona time is a collecting time. And once we get back into whatever it is we're doing, we probably have to uh, begin to let go of all that. Because the more you hold it, the worse it's going to get, uh, the heavier it's going to get on your shoulder. Okay. The second question, Charu, how might we use E to foster a ripple effect of empathy that moves from those interested and open to others harder to reach? Wow. You wish. <laughs> but this is this is what I'm thinking that a lot of the empathy work 
you know, there's a, there's this defined process which I I have I've had trouble buying into. Do this, say that, respond like this, and uh, I think what emerged for me was that primarily empathy had to do it to be empathetic. One needs to be curious. And how do we raise that curiosity in that space? Because if we can do that, then when some of them get interested, chances are that uh, others will also get dragged into that conversation. So again, we need to stay curious before we try to get other people curious about something. Is that making sense? Yeah. So that whole, uh, so while while it applies also in conflict, it also applies in peacetime. That we are we are conducting conversations and we are asking questions, and we are not just asking questions to ourselves, but we are also asking other people as we go along. So that whole process with everybody is a joint discovery. Yes, sir. Show me a wave of your hand or a thumbs up or something. I can see you're still curious. Yeah, no, that makes sense to me, and I I think it speaks particularly to where I am at. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I just as we go through this uh, first attempt, uh, if each one of us gets at least one thing, I, I guess it's a happy place. So <laughs> it may not be necessarily your own question, but somebody else's. The answer to somebody else's question might answer yours. Okay. Thank you. So, so yeah, my joy, Suki. Okay. The first thing that jumped into my head was remember why you were there. So that question is in your mind. What are some of the critical things to practice in the context of E and self management? How do we facilitate ourselves? and there's a whole bunch of notes i made so here they are i mentioned it earlier and when i was talking about the first uh, answering the first question uh, when you're doing what you're doing move with purpose without irritation frustration or anxiety we've talked about this in the context of climbing the wall when we went out those of us that did do you know wall climb by magic bus or wherever else and i think the word we used was how do we how do we go about the act of facilitation gracefully and uh, maybe this whole grace thing is the absence of irritation frustration or anxiety which means you're not trying to get somewhere very quickly you're just doing what uh, what needs to be happening in that moment so staying curious yeah yeah i mean you know you remember that wall and you're looking for that hole and what else describes curiosity so beautifully as somebody trying to reach out to that hole that they can uh, get it, you know that they can hang on to yeah the other piece was moving with curiosity and Uh, so moving with discovery in mind and here you know no matter what the circumstance sometimes the anxiety of a group will try and get us to that same old place again and uh, madhumati i think this is in response to your question as well um that the group kept saying that they wanted something different they wanted more they were probably have wanting answers what you gave them did not work for them and sometimes you just have to let everything go and say okay if none of my answers are good enough for you then uh, what are your answers what would you do and sometimes getting to that uh, because one of the worst places to get into with a group is them thinking that you have the answers hmm. even here Even here, 
So I have my answer, and uh, I'm guessing your teacher group had their answers, and uh-huh. they just needed to. We needed to get them to a place where they could articulate that answer for themselves, and then that becomes real for them. Otherwise, they're going to be shunning and uh, rejecting everything that we throw at them. And so often we will bump into a group like this that's not willing to accept anything you're saying, but they'll be polite about it. They just say no, that doesn't work. Give me something else. And give me something more. And give me something else. And uh, nothing really satisfies them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Third piece is heightened awareness. We've talked about heightened awareness in class when we, you know, when we talk about flow theory. That, that heightened awareness is when you're there so completely and you're listening to what's going on in the classroom, you're listening to them, uh, not being entertained by your own uh, movie going on inside your own head. So just be aware of that. Develop, now this is, this is something that I think, uh, uh, as I say it, I realize that I'm, I've put it interestingly, uh, develop an ability to focus on essentials. So what was essential in that conversation? How do I uh, pick? How do I decide? And will I be able to pick what's really essential? Can I um, navigate through that maze of questions and answers from the group to find out, okay, what's driving them? What is essential at that point in time? And I don't know how to do this, but here are some thoughts. The essentials possibly refer to the needs of the group. Uh, one of the biggest struggles in facilitation is really uh, uh, we get involved with so, uh, so much with ourselves. So to remember that it's not about you. So what you, what you facilitate is about them. And how you facilitate is about you. Yeah, that's a nice quotable quote. <laughs> I like it anyway. Vishwas, oh. can you repeat that? Sorry? Can you repeat what you just said? Yeah. What you, so uh, what you facilitate is about them. And how you facilitate is about you. So what you facilitate is what we call processing. How we process is about us. Where are we coming from? How are we listening to them? Have we uh, understood those essentials? Thank you, Vinay. Uh, And keeping in mind that whole thing when you're doing that. So I think in a nutshell, it's like, how do we learn to facilitate without struggle? And I tell you what, you will know you're facilitating without a struggle when you actually get to that place of no struggle. There's no easy way of telling you that this your okay, your day has arrived. So just keep going at it. Right. So, Nachi Kid, uh, I'm assuming your context is um, classroom. Yes. Okay. In the classroom, if those are the four things that, you know, critical thinking, creative thinking, communication, collaboration, it's perfect for anybody who wants to make their classrooms clean short. A simple strategy is to be able to do that is small group work groups, dialogue based discovery of every topic, every subject instead of the classroom, teacher delivering, how do we how do we get the group to explore the topic by themselves in smaller group and present to each other. That takes care of collaboration, communication, creative thinking, uh, critical thinking is definitely happening as they go through that process and Creative thinking will emerge as you get them to explore the topic beyond the text. 
right so vishwas another part of the question also is how do we marry the content like the syllabus the curriculum which has to be covered in certain amount of time mm-hmm. which uh, also you know kind of is a huge part of the system yeah and these skills okay i give up i am not even going to i'm not even going to try and answer <laughs> that because first of all this whole 45 minute block time makes no sense and you want to do do it in the old method you see the old method is designed for a 45 minute uh, classroom session if you're going to use any a new way of doing things then you have to have a new way of looking at things so i don't think i have an answer if uh, that's the question you're asking and how do i do it within a 45 minute thing uh okay so i'm not really asking about 45 minutes so mm-hmm. i apparently uh, have found a group of educators who are willing to go beyond these 45 minutes but still uh, the the problem is they still have to uh, you know cover the that, that amount of curriculum or syllabus uh, you know before the Garden. exam mm-hmm. that's the trouble they, they are willing to extend they are willing to you know go up, yeah you know be creative they have to be uh, one is there is risk involved they have to learn how to do it they have to be willing to risk and once you put all that together if they're still interested then it's immensely possible that's what we did in our experiential classrooms that you build the community first and then that whole colla- you know all those four c's it's easy it's honestly immensely easy but you but there is a half year investment in building the environment for it got it got it remember yeah. those stories from the session yeah yeah right so basically that's that's about it so i have to figure out a way to uh, connect with them on such a level that they are okay to invest that kind of uh, time and wait for results and not just be uh, uh, you know uh, you know behind covering the syllabus for every 3 months ka exam yeah you can't have, you know uh, when i what's that if you if you do the same thing it won't get you to a different place or if you do a different uh, thing uh, or that <laughs> uh, what what uh, what, what, what you you all won't get you there huh what got you you all won't get you there right man that is one and the other one is um, if you continue to do what you always did you will get what you always got right so if you want something different you have to do something different i think that's uh, that's the spirit of it yeah okay sahana there's no way and there's another thing you can know your or uh, you can know the color of the underwear your participants wear and that still will not be able to get you to a place where you can do anything better that's my that's my first answer and over the years we've tried to find out okay so how much do i really need to know about participants and uh, in corporate work there's a lot of that you know let's do this assessment let's do that test and then you do all that you do that remotely you uh, you do a lot of it but till that face to face happens it's anybody's game you don't really know because once they show up they show up and once they show up there then you can do stuff to get them to show off themselves till then it's all text Are you getting this? So even uh, unless you have the freedom to go and visit their workplace or their place space or wherever they are and uh, be a fly on the wall, uh, which is again then part of what uh, uh, of uh, what we do, uh, there is no way. So this is what I I can only share with you what I've always done. 
I've always used the first, depending on how long the program is, anywhere between a third to a fourth of program time in discovering the group. The, the, the theoretical words are energizers, de-inhibitizers, and trust. So you do these activities, you can do one of each, or just, just even getting them to horse around and play, doing energizers can give you immense insight into how they relate with one another. To see if you can, I think what's critical at that time is to do things and observe who they are in that current setting because uh, where they are with you is going to affect who they are. Does that make sense? Uh, from, a, from a strategy point of view, when you want to do stuff like that, choose your favorite activities that you don't have to think about what the brief is going to be and so on. So you take the stress off, off yourself, you run that, get them to play, and, and just watch off, and play with them even better. Because you know the activity, you know what's going to happen. If you get involved, uh, it's more fun. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, so uh, in my notes, you'll notice I say that get yourself out of, that, out of the equation. Yeah? Okay. Any questions? Issue. <laughs> Are you there? Yes, I'm there. Okay, let's check. All right. I think there's only one word I can think of. Manage yourself first. What do you mean by that? Um, are you feeling okay? Are you being reactive? Are you sitting there in judgment? Yeah, but this awareness is tough when actually that situation is happening. Yes, that's what we. That's why. That's why we're here. <laughs> okay. I I I don't know if there's an easy answer to that. Uh, tons of self preparation. Can you share your experience as to how you deal with it and like? What preparation you do? Over the years, I think what I have uh, started doing is, uh, I think I've gotten better at it. I used to, I, I, I used to be reactive as well in my uh, early days of uh, working uh, and agenda driven. And I wanted to, and I noticed that uh, I wanted to do what I wanted to do because I would like to do it. And the group was uh, incidental. But they, they were there. And the only reason they were there was for me to learn. And that was my trip. And I think I've come back full circle to that same place. But the spirit of it is very different. So I go hugely prepared. So I don't have to think about you know, what did I say earlier? Yeah. What you facilitate is about them. I'm comp I, I, I study. I'm over-prepared. And I land up doing only about 10% of what I'm prepared for. That's what I've noticed over the years. And then when I'm there with the group, the only thing that drives me is paying attention to how I'm facilitating. Can you be that prepared with your content so that you don't have to think about the content anymore and sequence and so on and so forth? And you'll notice that when you are that prepared, things will flow 
in the way that the group wants it to happen, not the way you want it to happen. Yeah, that makes sense. So, plan to death. And then, and then, come on, guys. Throw Can it I have away. a photo? Throw it away. Throw it away. Yay. Yeah. Throw it away, yeah. All right. Plan to death. And, and that, that's what that throw it away means. Throw that away. Because you know it. Been there, done that. What you have not done is how you facilitate, because that's about you. Uh, guys, he is not only frozen, but he's logged out. He'll need two minutes uh, till the time he said we can chat. Uh, maybe ask Vinay to share his point of view. So yeah. we can continue this. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, let me quickly share one thought that occurred to me on the whole note of questions. Um, I kind of subscribe to what uh, Vishwas was talking about um, as far as asking questions is concerned. More often than not, I find myself in, in a place where most questions are driven by the facilitator's agenda rather than the participant agenda. So in all the, in the practice of facilitation, what happens is we are thinking as seriously as we want to about design, about sequence, about what the right question is. And so the pressure continuously is on the facilitator. And if you succumb to that pressure at any point in time, then chances are your question is not going to go where you want it to go. So somewhere, uh, you know, there is this element of, uh, without getting too philosophical about it, there is this element of uh, being in the middle of all that chaos uh, in that storm, but being still and being able to see that uh, virtually like the matrix. <laughs> if that is, that is an example, being able to see each of those movements very clearly and therefore what your question on. So for me, questions, uh, I think, is a continuing journey. And uh, uh, I think that's a, that's a practice that is going to go on for as long as you are involved with any kind of group or any kind of interaction with any other human being is your ability to be connected yet detached. Oh, Vishwas. Yes. I was, okay. I was just sharing the whole question piece that you just spoke about. And my own challenges with questions. <laughs> yes, thank you. Right, so Madhumati, we spoke about your your classroom scenario. Hello, are you there? Uh, Am yes, I there? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you now. Uh, yeah, I thought I needed a little more clarity in what you said. Maybe could okay. you even repeat what you said? Okay, uh, what I was saying was that when when somebody comes back to you and says, okay, so uh, no, that's not a good answer, it won't work. Maybe the question, okay, so and when you when you hit that wall and you don't have any answers for them anymore, mm -hmm. then the only thing you can really uh, do is to uh, take it back to the group and say, okay, so uh, you want different solutions, right? And get them to explore those different solutions. Maybe ask them the question, what do you think will work? Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, they say, we don't know, that's why we're here, but we found, but you get into this loop of, Okay, but I'm telling you, I'm offering you this, and you're saying it won't work. You haven't even tried it. Then you get into this loop. And then the only thing at that point in time is question their intentionality. Only thing is what? Is question their intentionality. Okay. Like, do they really want an answer? Mm -hmm. And where is an answer going to come from? Are they looking for an answer from the outside? And, uh, and then the conversation really needs to go to their intention rather than pollution. The danger is us 
I mentioned earlier, us getting uh, thinking of ourselves as uh, answering machines and solutions to their problems, which only they know really well. Sure. Make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. But uh, like you already said about facilitating gracefully without irritation, frustration, and anxiety, I think when you get into this place, I think that automatically kind of follows. And uh, when I started questioning their intentionality, I felt like they were the group of students they were complaining about, with whom nothing mm. works. So that's exactly what is happening to me, just that the places were exchanged. There were those troublesome students. I was the facilitator where nothing was working. So then, uh, I don't know, fortunately or unfortunately, we ran out of time. So there, was, there wasn't a kind of closure. Yeah, and... Well, sometimes they won't be because we find ourselves in a place where we're not able to manage what's going on with us. True. And that'll happen often enough. So, now you have something new to try. Yeah. Or you can just tell them, hey, you know what? You sound exactly like your students. Oh, I didn't have the confidence to say it. Ah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Go out there. Do it with a smile. <laughs> and it usually works. Hmm. Okay. I really related to the other question that was asked earlier because there were these were uh, most of the teachers who were like coming at it with this were uh, supposedly those experienced teachers who said we have been there, done that, nothing works. But there were others who were uh, comparatively new to the profession who were more willing to try out these things. So that the wave of empathy, that question that came in really resonated with me because I began to wonder how I could have brought these uh, teachers to maybe kind of uh, help the others out. And not something that I could, I did at that point in time, of course. Mm. And the empathy wave takes time. It doesn't happen, yeah. you know, it's not like as simple as throwing a stone in a pond. Sure. It's time and it's diligence and, you know, you got to stay with them, <laughs> watch yourself through that whole process. Yeah. Yeah, it's a hard place. I've been there. Mm. Okay. Jayashree, I think you answered your own question. Jayashree? Are I'm you there? there? Yeah, I am. Okay, just checking. Uh, you, uh, you kind of answered your own question, right? No? No, could you explain? Okay. Influence is you have an intent. You have a goal. You have an objective in mind. And you want, to, want them to be influenced. Manipulation is, so both are agenda driven, I think. But one has choice, the other doesn't. Which one okay. has choice? Sorry? Which one has choice? I influence. So I choose. And if you, uh, at the end of that influencing session, if you walked out feeling like you were not successful, then you know what you were trying to do. <laughs> which was uh, this question, which was this question comes more from the point of uh, when I am aware that somebody is manipulating to get the result. Uh, how do I confront in that situation to help them see that this is not influencing because the situation demand, but this is manipulation. So that that uh, communication, how do we get it done? Because uh, 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 can I give a Why very specific you? example? Can I, would, would that help? Yeah. yeah. So mm, we are two facilitators uh, wanting to transact a lesson or something like that. 
uh, and then um, uh, I tried to do it a certain way based on how the child is able to receive, how the child is able to understand, or what are the what are the areas which I need to do before so that this child is able to understand this particular piece of information. But there is another uh, way also. Uh, I'll see to it that this is transacted to the child no matter what. Instead of working on the readiness bit or instead of uh, seeing what the child needs there, it is more about uh, this is the easier way out. So I need to get it done like this way. So if there are two sets of things, then how do we actually show the mirror that, see, we can't do this because uh, it is not about us doing something. It is about the person who is receiving it, whether the person is able to receive it properly or not. So this is something I'm... Uh, you just did it. You just did it. You know, what you what you said to me. Uh huh. You just have to say to them. Okay. And wait for it to um, uh, take its own time to show up. Otherwise, you're doing the same thing, no? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just remember that, uh, what was that? Moving with purpose without irritation, frustration, and anxiety with grace. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah thank you. Yeah. Great. So, hey, we threw the questions. The other, the other thoughts in the context of all the stuff that we've been talking about, I'm just going to close with some of these thoughts. In all the stuff that we want to do and, you know, want to do better and want to be more experiential, want to be more better facilitators, just remember that personal breakthroughs do not happen daily. It's not as if every day you're going to hit with a bolt of lightning or a new thought or whatever. But, and the only time they really come is when there is when there is great purposefulness. And there are some things that you can try and, you know, practice. A classic example in these times is when your phone rings. Just watch in that moment what happens. Do I grab it immediately? Can I let it ring for a few times? Take a few deep breaths along with the ringtone before I really pick it up. Uh, the doorbell rings. Is life going to change completely in two seconds if I delay that process? Can I just slow that whole thing down? So you can practice some of these daily activities. Just it, And it's just a slowing down the whole process. And I think that comes in extremely useful in the act of facilitation because that's what we're trying to do, we're trying to listen to the other person and what they're saying rather than getting involved with what's going on with ourselves. Yeah, breathe all the way from the stomach when you feel anxiety and frustration. We've talked about it. It's on, it's at least on the t-shirts of two different batches in a big way. Breathe purposefully, I think one batch had. Um, so uh, the way to describe it is how do we you know it's that place of quiet and calm In it's the eddy of the river so you have a fast flowing river you've got white water and it's like it looks really turbulent but if you look at the river long enough you'll notice that there is this quiet place there's always a quiet place in that turbulence And even as instructors, our job is to get those people from uh, the turbulent water and get them and help them find that quiet place and see if you can do that. 
and to allow it. I think that's uh, sometimes we they find a quiet place and we say, "Oh, what are you what are you sitting there quietly for? Go run around in circles and your own tail." So see if you can if we can accept it when they find it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's pretty much it.